Good afternoon. I'm uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Richard Miller, President of Olin College, as today's speaker in our View from the Top series. This series gives the college community a chance to hear from leading thinkers on technology innovation and the driving force behind it, engineering education. I'd like to thank the Berkeley chapter of uh, ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, for co-sponsoring today's lecture. And they are the folks in the back of the room there and the folks who greeted you. So thank you, ASME. I'm also honored to welcome the alumni and members of our Dean Society who are joining us here today. The loyalty and support of our alumni and other friends of the college play a key role in advancing our mission, which is educating leaders, creating knowledge, and serving society. Before I introduce Richard Miller, I invite you to mark your calendars for two additional special events coming to the college. Uh, March 18th, let me make sure I got this date right, on Tuesday, March 18th, we'll celebrate the third annual Ernie Kuhl Distinguished Lecture with special guest Sehat Sutarja, co-founder, co chairman, and CEO of, Marvel, of the Marvel Technology Group. Uh, the format will be a conversation with uh, Professor Sujay King Liu, and he will relate how he and his co-founders took Marvell to global provenance in semiconductor innovation in just 20 years and share his views on what's ahead. Uh, this promises to be a fantastic conversation, and I hope you'll join us. The lecture will be Tuesday, March 18th, here in this room in the Bonatow Auditorium at 4 o'clock. Then on Thursday, April 10th, we'll have the pleasure of welcoming Dale Doherty, founder and CEO of Maker Media. Dale has helped to promote hands-on learning and engineering by spearheading the Make magazine and the Make Affair. And you might have seen the most recent issue about how you build quadrotors in your... Uh, in your spare time, so that certainly seems to have gotten a lot of people excited. So more information about all of these events may be found on our website, coe.berkeley.edu. Let me now introduce today's speaker, Richard Miller. As many of you know, uh, we are huge believers in treating engineering as a holistic discipline that draws from the arts, humanities, and social sciences, as well, of course, as the traditional science and mathematics. We are especially passionate about the role that design can play in making engineering responsive to human needs and relevant to pressing global challenges. This is why we are so delighted to introduce Richard Miller of Olin College to the Berkeley engineering community. And a special thanks to Jerry Fiddler here on the second row for having made the introduction. So thank you, Jerry. Uh, Olin is a relatively new engineering college in Massachusetts that approaches education from an interdisciplinary perspective. Just as we are doing here at Berkeley, Olin focuses on engineering as a creative discipline and prepares students to be engineering innovators. Richard Miller was appointed president and first employee of Olin College in 1999. Previously, he served on the engineering faculties of USC and UC Santa Barbara, and he served as dean of the University of Iowa's College of Engineering from 1992 to 1999. As he was telling us before this, his, uh, he's been mo gradually moving from tropical climates to <laughs> the more glacial climates of, uh, <laughs> of uh, Boston. He was saying the uh, zero degrees was, uh, maybe that was the, not the daytime high, but... Uh, in Boston last night. With a background in applied mechanics, interests in innovation, he also said, by the way, control, so I got to plug uh, mechatronics and control. He was telling Tommy this before the lecture. As well as interest in innovation in higher education, Dr. Miller is the author of more than 130, 100 reviewed journal articles and other technical publications. Together with two Olin colleagues, he received the 2013 Bernard M. Gordon Prize from the National Academy of Engineering for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education. Dr. Miller is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a recipient of the Marlowe Award for Creative and Distinguished Leadership from ASWE, the American Society for Engineering Education. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California, UC Davis, which recognized him with its Distinguished Engineering Alumnus Award. His master's is from MIT, and his PhD is from Caltech. Please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Richard Miller. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, it's great to be back in California. Um, as I was telling the dean, uh, it was quite cold when I left home, and we have two feet of ice on our front yard. I um, can't remember ever seeing ice of that kind when I grew up in central California. Um, so anyway, um, I really do believe California is God's country. Um, now, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm hoping to do with this talk, this time that we have together. I want to cover four things here sort of uh, quickly so that we'll have some time for Q&A, uh, how the school got founded and why, <clears throat> something about what it is, uh, the Olin Learning Model today, and then the lessons learned. It's really a laboratory, so we've spent quite a bit of time experimenting. And uh, we've, we think we've learned certain things that are transferable, and I'll try to share that. And then finally, I'll talk about the road ahead, which has a lot to do with our interactions with other universities. So first, the founding of the school. Uh, Franklin Olin, who you see pictured there on the left, was the founder of the um, uh, Olin Corporation, in, which is a materials and metals company. And he passed away in uh, 1952. And his funds, uh, the personal wealth from his wife and himself, uh, were used for philanthropy in higher education to give opportunities to others. And in fact, there are 78 buildings on 58 university campuses around North America that have Olin on them. And that's my first encounter with the Olin Foundation was in Olin Hall at USC when I was there. Um, so the, the um, school itself was created by charter in 1997 by the F.W. Olin Foundation when it suspended the building grants program and decided instead to devote all the rest of their money, which was about $460 million, to starting over in higher education. And this was not something they did uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm. It took them four years of hand-wringing to decide that this was needed. Um, they, it's a lot of work and a lot of risk. And they had considered instead giving the money to an existing school that was doing everything really well. But they were convinced if they did that, that would not result in change anywhere else. Uh, they considered giving it to a very successful private university that had everything except engineering, and then maybe they would endow the engineering school. But they were worried that they would in, then inherit the academic culture of the institution, including the promotion and tenure and the provost and so forth. And so they decided reluctantly we have to start over. And if you do the math, um, they didn't have enough money to start Berkeley. And so uh, they needed partners so that they wouldn't have to build the athletic stadium and all the rest. And think of Claremont schools as a model. And that's where they uh, found the folks at um, Babson College who were willing to sell them the land. And that's where we located. So now we have developed a partnership with other schools. Um, I was the first employee, as um, was mentioned. Uh, my wife still thinks of this as my midlife crisis. And, uh, <laughs> She frequently points out to me that um, I'm not smart enough to know how much trouble I'm really in. And she's, she's rarely wrong. Um, I highlighted this 2001 year. Well, we did something called the Olin Partner Year. And the Olin Partner Year was an experiment with a group of 30 students who lived in construction trailers on the parking lot in the, near the soccer field for a year while the buildings were being built. They were not students. Uh, there were 15 boys and girls. We were on first-name basis, and they were partners with us in inventing the program. So we tried all kinds of outrageous things that we knew would fail just so we could watch them fail. Now, you can't do that when you're offering a course for credit, and people are real students. So it's a very rare opportunity. A lot of what happened that year really turned us around in terms of understanding how people learn, and you see it embedded in our program now. That was a key thing. So... Um, Mr. Milas, whose picture you see there, was the president of the Olin Foundation, whose vision it was to create the school with the remainder of their funds. And he had been talking with a lot of people for four years about the unhappiness about the way engineering is taught. And he's really talking about undergraduate engineering, not the PhD level program, uh, the, the large uh, leak in our pipeline. I'm sure you all know that in this room, but last year, only um, about 4% of the bachelor's degrees awarded to universities anywhere in the US went to students studying any kind of engineering. And it's a declining market share. And about half of the students who enroll in engineering in, in the fall will never graduate in engineering. They will transfer to something else or just leave. Um, and only 
of the students who graduate in engineering are women. Um, obvious issues. And this is despite a lot of time and trouble trying to fix it, including the work that uh, Joe Bordogna did at NSF in the 90s. Some of you might remember that, the Engineering Education Coalitions Program spent a lot of money for groups of universities to work together and then abandoned it when the um, Southwest Research Institute study of that work concluded that it wasn't really working. Um, Joe, John Prados at ABET was the leader of the Criteria 2000 effort, was also one of the first people on our board of trustees. Um, so the founding precepts of Olin include this interesting statement. Olin College is intended to be different, not for the mere sake of being different, but in order to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. So right from conception, the Olin Foundation imagined that this school would become sort of a national laboratory that would experiment and share results with other schools. If all it does is produce a small number of great engineering students, it wasn't worth the money. That's what I hear from my board of trustees. Okay? So that's why I can't do that by sitting at home teaching class. I have to get on planes and go to other places. Um, so Olin College is intended to become a laboratory. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what the school has become today. So we're fast-forwarding to 2014. Um, the current learning model, well, Olin is a small residential undergraduate engineering school. Every student at Olin um, is enrolled in an engineering degree program. We don't offer any other degrees. Um, well, there's only 350 total, and we're not planning to grow the enrollment. Um, with that size, we're like a test tube. We can reinvent and redeploy the whole program in about nine months. Um, we have about a nine-to-one student-faculty ratio. You can read the rest. The interesting part uh, are these prescriptions from the Olin Foundation. Okay? Olin does not have academic departments. We don't offer tenure. Uh, everything at Olin has an expiration date, and we have uh, very low tuition. Okay, this is because they wanted to change the culture in higher ed, not just the academic program in engineering. Uh, that's what the campus looks like, at least when it's not frozen. Um, <laughs> you can sort of remember what leaves look like. Um, now, this is, this is just a brief, this is really all I'm going to say about the, the academic model that we're using today. Um, first off, we have this thing called Candidates Weekend, which we just finished uh, last week, no student gets into Olin except by spending a weekend of, and we, you might call it interviews, but they're re interview is the wrong word because an interview conjures up the idea that you put a tie on and you sit across the table from somebody who asks you questions about thermodynamics. And that's not what happens. We put them in groups and they spend an entire weekend together. There are people from our community embedded in their group. They do challenges and it's not about science and math. It's about teamwork, vision, creativity, and passion. Uh, it's quite different. But that goes on, and nobody gets in, in, in admitted unless they go through that program. Um, for those who are familiar with it, the, really the core uh, backbone on which all of our learning is based is design thinking. And design thinking is an academic um, uh, pedagogy that developed in art schools rather than engineering schools. And you actually don't need science to do design thinking. Science, though, is a great complement in the sort of the power tools that allows you to do it better. Um, this culminates in senior projects, which we call SCOPE. Uh, SCOPE are corporate-sponsored projects. Um, each student team of about four to six has to work for a client for a year. Uh, the client provides the ideas. They also provide uh, $50,000 uh, in funding for the project. They're often non-disclosure agreements. Um, students have a statement of work. They have a schedule of deliverables in terms of uh, reports. And we shut down the campus at the end of the year. And there is a kind of uh, projects day where we bring all of the corporate folks on campus and the students present. Um, this, is, this is quite a bit like the uh, Harvey Mudd Clinic program. So if you've seen that, it has a lot of similarities, except that the students here are more interdisciplinary. We often have students uh, on those project teams from Babson College, which are MBA students in business sometimes students from Wellesley College, which might be a mathematician or a physicist or something. Uh, so it's a little broader, but quite similar. And Expo is completely different. Expo is our version of a recital in a music school 
at the end of every semester, every student has to play something for an audience. Well, at the end of every semester at Olin, every student has to perform in front of an audience something from their project work. Okay? Uh, they get to select it, and we have about 350 visitors um, that come. And so they have either to do a 30-minute lecture or they have to do a poster presentation with Q&A. Um, every student, by the time they've graduated, has done that eight times, and that really has quite an impact. It changes who you are. Anyone who's a musician knows if you stand on stage at Carnegie Hall and you play, play solo, it changes who you are, uh, not just what you know. And that sort of thing you can see. Uh, there is this um, requirement to complete an independent study on your own for which you do not have the prerequisites. So it's learning how to learn, uh, which we call the self-study. Uh, every student has to do a copstone project in arts and humanities or else in entrepreneurship. Um, all students have to start and run a business or an enterprise in one of the courses. This is uh, borrowed from the pedagogy at Babson College. Um, and, of course, the curriculum is continuously under review. In fact, we have, before we graduated our first student, we reinvented the program twice, which was a little nerve-wracking and a, a little uh, difficult for the accreditation board to get their arms around, too. Um, it, change is a good thing, but, you know, enough change. Um, but actually, it's not about the courses, and that's why I don't want to go into this in a great deal of detail. If you were to come and say, oh, we want to do what Olin does, let's copy down the syllabus and the textbook and deploy it here, you, it wouldn't happen. It, because it's not about the courses. It's really about the culture. It's the learning culture, which is a relationship. It's, it's how the students think about who's responsible for, for learning and, and why they're doing this and how the faculty members think about their role uh, in the institution. That's what's different. And you can do this in many different ways. Um, our metric, best metric for de deciding whether the culture is right is a statement which you hear frequently from Olin students. They'll tell you, we've never worked this hard in our life, and there's nothing else we'd rather be doing. And when you get those together, um, people are infected with the disease now, and, and you can't stop them from learning. You, you, you couldn't pay them to quit because they're obsessed with trying to become an expert in certain things, what they really care about. Um, okay, so I said design thinking is one of the keys to what we do. So this is really the definition of design that I inherited as a, as a faculty member before Olin. You start with specifications and you, and you go through the design process until you develop a prototype. You put that in the out box and you put a check in the, in the transcript that says I completed my design course. At Olin, it starts with people and it ends with people in the market. Uh, one illustration of this is a course that every student has to take in which we ask them at the beginning, in small groups, identify a group of people whose lives you want to change. Okay? This may be uh, your grandmother who just was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and so they put her in assisted living. It may be that you're, you absolutely love coffee, and you hang out constantly at Starbucks, and your heroes are the baristas at Starbucks. We don't really care. Uh, we then identify about a dozen people in that group for the students to interview and to spend time with for about five weeks. They develop a sociological profile of who those people are. Um, then they pitch ideas for a technology or a system or a device that doesn't yet exist to that client group until the client group tells them that would change their lives and they would do anything to own this. But it doesn't exist. And then the students have to develop specifications for this technology that doesn't yet exist. And if they had a second page that had a schematic of how you build it, it would be a patent, and they're 19. Okay? That kind of purpose-driven, um, contextualized learning of engineering is what infects the students with this obsession to, to continue to learn. It does have some unintended consequences, which I'll tell you about later. Um, now, Olin, as was mentioned earlier, has, takes a holistic view of what it means to be an engineer. It's not just about applied science. And for us, we think it's, uh, it's related to this intersection between engineering, business, and liberal arts. Um, at Olin, we accomplish that with our partnerships. In fact, we have a very close partnership with Babson College, which I mentioned before, but also Wellesley College, which is two miles away. And there's a shuttle bus that leaves every 20 minutes that goes between the campuses. And students um, and heavily cross-enroll. And in fact, uh, students freely cross-enroll. There's no fee in involved at all. 
and um, Olin bought the land from Babson, so as we're fond of saying, Olin is closer to Babson than Babson is, um, because our dining hall is closer to their residence halls than their dining hall. So we see them <laughs> all the time, um, which is a good thing. Um, and actually, we've been thinking of this trio of universities as a virtual university. Um, and in fact, I have a close partnership with the presidents of the other two schools. Um, one of my techniques for building this was quite simple. I reached out to the other two presidents and invited them to co-teach a course with me, a course in leadership and ethics, which used to be very common in liberal arts colleges 100 years ago. But over the years, uh, universities have um, shied away from the role of talking about values. And it's not an easy conversation to have. So um, I got them both to agree. And what this does, uh, we teach a, a senior seminar that has students from all three campuses. It gets me on the calendar for one-on-one -on -one time with both presidents once a week for a year. Um, and there you have an opportunity to build a partnership. And we've done uh, quite a lot with that. OK, so there is the founding of the school and the learning model. Now let me tell you a little bit about lessons learned. So, so what's happened? Uh, what's changed in our thinking about what engineering and education is about? Uh, so I want to do this in sort of four pieces. First, we believe that education really has to change everywhere. There are forces at work here that are larger than any of us. And secondly, we need to change three things about how we teach. We need to change who we teach. OK, that's going to take a while to sink in. Uh, we need to change what we teach, and we need to change how we teach. Because you could say, in a way, we're teaching the wrong people, we're teaching them the wrong stuff, and we're using pedagogical methods which are known to be largely ineffective. Otherwise, we're doing a great job. Okay? <laughs> and, and that's why we only have 4%, and it's declining, and half of them are going away. A lot of the students, by the way, who transfer out of engineering have higher GPAs than the kids who stay. So that's not because they couldn't do the math. All right, why is it that education has to change? Well, a couple of things I think are really interesting. First off, I still like this hockey stick graph, um, which you probably have seen. The uh, global population over all of recorded history. And you can see that it was below 1 billion until about 1920. Um, and then, since then, look at this spike. Uh, what will slow it down? Um, it's going to be 9 billion by the middle of this century. I personally believe there isn't one aspect of life on the planet that won't be affected by that fact. Um, this has to do with sustainability of our natural resources. As competition for resources is going to spike um, conflict and security issues. Global health. Health becomes a completely different concern when you have a densely populated planet where everybody's at 35,000 feet in an airplane. Um, and by the way, not everything that's important in life is about protection from some threat to your life. We have developed, uh, thankfully, in our population, an expectation that every generation will have a better life than those before us. Um, now, try to figure out how to do that with this, this hockey stick spike. And of course, you can see the, the NAE's grand challenges for the 21st century, which are quite different from their summary of the greatest achievements of technology in the 20th century, which were all about things. You know, it's a wonderful coffee table book. Um, if you have an aunt or a knuckle like I do that don't really know what an engineer is, um, and you keep trying to explain it, well, if you have this coffee table book, it says, you know, go back 100 years in the early 1900s, and you think about what's happened. Engineers were responsible for electrification, for clean drinking water, for um, the automobile for the telephone, for the airplane, for the internet, for the radio, for TV, for space travel, and on and on and on. So these are things. And we keep thinking of the model of innovation as you go into a garage and you invent something, you get it to work, you throw it over the wall to the free market, and somehow the world changes for the better. That's the 20th century, OK? Now you look at the 21st century, um, what's going on here? Um, sustainability, which is pretty much what's happening up there. Unintended consequences of the technologies of the 20th century. Okay? Global climate change, the carbon. When we were thinking about designing the car, 
um, way back. The, I, the idea that a very tiny fraction of the exhaust gas was unburned fuel didn't seem significant, particularly as you walked around the streets of New York and you could smell what horses left behind that we were replacing seemed like a pretty good deal. But when you apply it over that many people, these small percentages have enormous unintended consequences. And to design for this world, you need to get your arms around unintended consequences. Um, and that's part of the engineer's responsibility. So basically, the problems in the 21st century are inherently global. They cross disciplines, they cross time zones, they cross political boundaries. And they are inherently um, uh, complex. They involve not just scientific principles, but social, economic, political, even religious dimensions. Because if you're going to get a solution to work, the population has to be willing to adopt it in large ways. So you have to be thinking about who these people are and wh why do they behave the way they do. Um, the, the key, I believe, is the, the multidisciplinary, uh, global, and systems thinking. Now, the way I learned engineering, we started quite narrow. Okay? Um, I w remember teaching for years in the mechanics field. We would have courses that would talk about solutions to problems in two dimensions, and then the solution to problem in three dimensions, the problem in cylindrical coordinates, the problem in rectangular coordinates, the problem in spherical coordinates with lots and lots of formulas, and the kids raise their hands, always the same questions. Dr. Miller, um, is this going to be on the test? Um, are you going to give us these formulas, or do we have to remember them? You know? um, not multidisciplinary, not global, and certainly not thinking about people at all. The idea of how you formulate the problems, how, how you can create the context and understand what the solution should look like, is left for some later day. It's always, trust me, you know, this is the stuff you need to know. And I kept waiting and waiting, and that, never, that day never came because I went to graduate school, and, and graduate school just got more narrow okay, and deeper. And then the PhD got extremely narrow and deep. Uh, so I became a terrific expert in this one thing, but I never got around to the people part. And I think that in a, there's a sense in which students are wet cement. And you can't just stick this on to them when they're 35 at mid-career. They need to begin to think in multidisciplinary ways. They need to be able to communicate with people in different disciplines early. That's what we're not doing. So we need a new kind of engineering innovator. We certainly need innovators, but we need to be a different kind of engineering innovator. Now, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble here, but I think this is true. Um, our traditional higher education and the way we've organized it may actually be preventing us from producing these innovators. Now, I could talk a lot about this, but I'm going to just briefly summarize. When kids are in K through 12, they have largely a common curriculum. They learn about math, science, so art, history, physical education. Then they graduate and they go off to college. When they go to college, like Berkeley, they'll enroll in something like the School of Engineering. And when you do that, this could actually be a map of the Berkeley campus. Okay? There's a quad up here where the engineering school is. And all those buildings are within easy walking distance of each other because students are going to take most of their courses, like three quarters of their courses, are going to be taken in that quad. Um, on the other hand, there's a business school somewhere. I actually don't know where the Haas school is, but it's probably not right here. Um, and then there are students who major in things like psychology, arts, and humanities. Okay? Um, the engineering folks um, take... In fact, to be a better credited, three quarters of the coursework that you take has to be related to science, math, and engineering. And actually, that's a good thing. Every time you buckle up on an airplane on the way home, I'm glad the kids had a lot of science, math, and engineering. Okay? That, that's not an accident. Um, on the other hand, it, re it results in thinking about the world through a lens. Un unintentionally, maybe. But every question that you ask in an engineering school is related to feasibility. Can, can this be done? Is this consistent with what we know about the natural law? It's all about what you can do, um, the feasibility lens. But if you go to the business school, you have a different lens. In fact, to be AACSB accredited, one half of all your coursework has to be in this model where viability is the primary lens that you look at the world, management, accounting, and so forth. Um, which is great. I'm glad we have accountants that 
have had courses like that. It's a good thing. But you see what's happening is that originally they were, the students were all in the middle. They ran into each other a lot. And now they've gone off and they've specialized. And, and the students, by the way, that major in psychology, arts, and humanities have a completely different outlook on life. You could say the lens that they're looking through is desirability. It's about human intention. For example, um, students in this field have, have questions like, what's the meaning of truth? Or what's the meaning of beauty? Or what's the meaning of love? You think these are important things? I mean, this is what motivates people. These are the kinds of questions that are not answered by numbers, though, or graphs. Um, it, it takes narrative and context and experiential um, learning in order to appreciate what the context is. So they all look at the world that way. In fact, it's possible to go through this domain and never have a science or a math course. I know this because I have a daughter who did it. Okay? <laughs> we have discussions about this all the time. And she, she said, but dad, I got a very high score on my AP math um, when I was in high school. So they put a check in that box and they didn't require me to take any more. And she never had a natural science. And she graduated cum laude and did really great, but we can't talk about you know, global climate change. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Does this matter? I think this is huge. Okay? Why? Because these things are fundamental to the notion of innovation. I don't think you'll be able to think of any innovation that isn't simultaneously feasible and also viable and also desirable in the free market. So in one head, somebody has to have the concept of how all three of these things come together. And in fact, I can say, when I was a young faculty member, my understanding of what innovation is was quite different. It was basically it all comes from just-in-case science. So I was sort of prepared to go to Washington and to talk to my congressman or senator and lobby for an increase in the NSF budget so they could send more money to our universities. Because we will create more science, and then we'll throw them over the wall to the tech transfer office who will sprinkle them with, sprinkle them with pixie dust and they'll turn into businesses. And that will generate new revenue, which will go back in the tax, tax system, and so you could send more money to the universities. That's pretty much it. Okay? That's what I call a pathway to innovation through feasibility. It does work, but it's not the only thing. All right? And we'll, uh, as an engineer, I can say, see, we've made airplanes this way, we've made cars, we've made the internet, and it's generated revenue, it's lots of new companies. So QED, that's it. And, but unfortunately, through my experience, I've been asked to be a member of the Board of Trustees at Babson College, which is an interesting place. So it's a business school. Um, now, they talk about innovation all the time. They never mention science or engineering. And for years, I thought, well, you know, just, uh, you know, I'm doing service to humanity. I'll just sit here, <laughs> um, not say anything. And then it dawned on me, what is innovation anyway? So we began to, to scratch our heads and think a lot about that. We eventually came up with, for us, a way of thinking about it and how it's differentiated. It's a very overused word. So we think that creativity is the process of having original ideas and insights. And, and that's not our definition. I think um, Sir Ken Robinson had that. And inventiveness is the process of having original ideas and insights that have value. Okay? So it's not just art. Um, although art has value too. Um, and innovation is the process of having original ideas and insights that have value and then implementing them in such a way that it changes the way people live. Okay? Without the implementation, it's not an innovation. It's just an idea. And a really profound innovation is an innovation that changes the world so profoundly that you can't remember what life was like before it happened. Uh, my kids still can't imagine how the caveman must have lived without the cell phone. I mean, it's just not possible to live without this thing. It must have always been there. Um, that's a profound innovation. OK, well, in business, there are a number of profound innovations. Has anybody ever heard of the credit card? Do you think that's changed life on the planet? It didn't, in fact, result, I mean, it isn't the result of a new basic science in physics. It's a way of organizing transactions. It's quite different. The desirability 
path may be the most profound. Okay? What does Facebook sell exactly? I think it sells the opportunity to tell your story to someone else. It's a very convenient platform to tell what you're passionate about to someone else who has similar beliefs. That's a fundamental force of nature that wasn't really discovered before, at least not, uh, paid, no one paid real attention to it. And why, I'm going to speculate, is that every human that was ever born has a profound need to be the most important person in somebody else's life. And, when that's, and the way you do that is you do that by telling your story. And as a result, when you give them an opportunity to do that, billions of people sign up, and they become extraordinarily creative. They use visuals. They use video. They use images and probably some that they shouldn't, okay? Become very creative in doing this. That is one of the, you know, Facebook is one of the uh, skyrocketing companies that's capitalized on the stock market in the last 10, 15 years. If you don't understand that, I don't think you have a chance to be an innovator who changes the game in the 21st century. So we have to broaden what we think about in, in edu education for engineering. You need all three. OK, let's move on. Who we teach. Um, are we attracting the right people into engineering to begin with? This is a different task now than you know, solving mechanics equations in two dimensions in spherical coordinates. Um, do we need a broader definition of engineering to attract the people in that are going to do this work? And frankly, I think this, if you did nothing else, this would probably make a huge change in the 4% number. Um, the, what we tell the rest of the world that engineering is about couldn't be more uh, off-putting. Okay? And we've got numbers to prove it. Uh, nevertheless, we continue to stay there. Um, so what is an engineer? And we spent a fair amount of time scratching our head thinking about this. I claim that I was actually trained as an applied scientist. That's what, I, that's what I got from Caltech and from MIT in particular. I know how to write papers to get them reviewed in journals. Same thing happens in uh, life science. If somebody gets really worried about a disease and NIH spends a lot of money, what happens is you get a lot of research papers. You don't actually get a cure. Somebody else has to make the cure. Uh, it's applied science. It's very important, but it's not exactly an engineer. If you talk to people, you know, Merriam-Webster dictionary, interesting definition, doesn't mention the word science. Isn't that funny? If you talk to uh, somebody at ABET, they'll tell you this is what they are. If you talk to somebody in a corporation, one of my favorites is the definition of um, the former president of Wellesley College. To engineer is to make. OK? She's a poet. I think she got pretty close to this. Has anybody heard of the maker movement? That's us. That's what engineers do. Why do they have to create a movement to do that? We've been doing this all the time. Okay? Um, at Olin, our definition is, an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and does whatever it takes to make it happen. Now, the science is buried in the whatever it takes to make it happen. But look, it starts with vision. What is it about the SAT test that identifies vision? And by the way, you can know what the answer is and not have the courage and the passion and the determination and the obsession to make things happen against adversity. Um, both of those things are fundamental to this definition of what an engineer is. So if that's the kind of people we're going to produce, maybe we should look for them at the beginning. Um, why am I here? Because my math teacher in high school said I was good at math. I had actually never met an engineer until I became a freshman at the University of California. I never met a person with a PhD either. I just took it on faith that apparently it has something to do with math. Okay? Um, there's, a, there's a lot that we could benefit from by thinking differently and talking differently about engineering. Okay, uh, when you start thinking more broadly now, um, we ran into the work of Howard Gardner. Has anybody heard of Howard Gardner in the audience? Usually there's a few hands go up. Cognitive scientist at Harvard. Um, he won the MacArthur Prize in 1983 for the theory of multiple intelligences. Um, basically, what he was doing was a very curious sort of guy, investigating the validity of the IQ test. Everybody thought the IQ test was a great idea. I mean, you might as well have it tattooed on your forehead. It, it tells you what you can do in life. 
However, when you start looking closely at the data, it actually doesn't work that well. In fact, he found it has almost no correlation with success in life. Um, it does have a small correlation with how you'll do on the next course in college. Once you graduate, it doesn't tell you whether you're going to be a Nobel Prize winner or, or a taxi driver or whether you're going to be successful in a marriage or whether you're going to have chronic disease in the midlife or any of that. It actually doesn't help very much. And, it, and along the way, he discovered that all humans have at least seven independent intelligences, most of which are the result of uh, significant brain circuits which are not available to your memory or, or logic. Uh, if you haven't thought about this, this is something that, that um, there's a lot here, okay? The explosion in neuroscience in the last decade is profound. In fact, I was telling one of our board members today, if I was a freshman starting over, I would be really tempted to study neuroscience rather than engineering because I think it explains so much of what's going on. Okay, a good example of this. So how did Olin deal with this? We started direct, directly looking for people with multiple intelligences. And we found, for example... Diana Dabby. Uh, Diana is a professor of electrical engineering and music. And no, we don't give music degrees. Okay? But di that's who she is. Um, it's not her title. Diana started life as a concert pianist. Um, she's played solo at Carnegie Hall. Um, she teaches part-time at Juilliard. She's a composer. She has toured Europe and Asia. And in mid-career, she became interested in electronic music and decided she needed to go back to school. So against all odds, she completed a PhD in electrical engineering at MIT, working for M.R. Bose. You heard of the speaker guy? Okay. Her thesis is in chaos theory, applied to the variations of musical scores by Bach and Gershwin. And so she has a nonlinear oscillator that generates variations on the musical score. She's got a patent on this. Um, we talked to her about her career, and she said, well, I'm teaching circuit design at MIT on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then I'm teaching music theory at Tufts University on Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm not telling the other one what I'm doing, because, <laughs> because if they find out, you know, they won't respect me. And we said, oh, no, no, it's time to come out of the closet. That's what we do. <laughs> at Olin. And we have a number of faculty members. They're not all like this, but we have a number of faculty members like this. This is a home for people with multiple intelligences. Okay. By the way, as you think about the challenges in the 21st century, the value of having an encyclopedic knowledge of all those formulas and spherical coordinates um, is got a very low half-life. A lot of the challenges that we're going to face in the 21st century are not defined yet. And in fact, the ability to be adaptive creative, and to conceive of new sciences and new technologies may be more valuable than having a, tr a perfect test scores on the SAT. So that raises up the, the question that maybe creativity is something that should be as important as knowledge. So that raises, so, so what exactly is creativity? Um, you know, this, is a, a, this slide actually tells a story. Um, for years, I used to tell students um, when you graduate from the university, you're not an educated person, okay? You're just beginning your career of learning. So, in fact, you have to continually learn every day. So I'm going to give you a challenge. I think every student here, from the day you graduate, should make, raise your right hand and make a commitment. I will read at least one nonfiction book in every semester for the rest of my life, okay? In a field outside of your major, so you have some hope of running into what's happening in those other two circles that we were looking at. And so they all said, wow, that's a great idea, Dr. Miller. What have you read? Okay. <laughs> huh. So I started putting books in my briefcase every time I would fly. And I decided where I'll start is in cognitive science and education because that's what I'm doing. I'm not, shouldn't I know something about this? So these are like 10 of my favorite books recently. Uh, reading these, and you have to read them cover to cover, or it doesn't count, all right? Um, it's not reading the jacket of the book. Um, three of them, if you were going to start, that I'd highly recommend are these three, okay? In particular, uh, Jonah Lehrer's book, How We Decide, will change the way you think about how the brain works and how you make decisions. And it's not all about logic. Um, Norm Dolage's book, 
uh, the brain that changes itself is about brain plasticity and explains very eloquently why I can't speak Spanish even though I had four years of it in high school. The brain apparently is a dynamic allocation memory and if it's like a chalkboard and you write these things on it and when you don't use it for a long period of time, your brain notices that and it erases it and puts the stuff that you did use. So it's gone. Um, you have to use it constantly, which has a lot to do with pedagogical work as well. By the way, if you've not done this, and this is a school, so I'm going to give you homework, all right? Um, now, this is, you don't have to read anything. This is a YouTube homework. Uh, it's a TED Talk in 2006 by Sir Ken Robinson. Has anybody heard of this already? Yeah, yeah a lot of people have. Uh, it should change the way you think about what creativity is and why it's important. Okay. So maybe who we teach could change. What about what we teach? Are we teaching the right stuff? All right, well, watching those students in the Olin Partner year deal with challenges, we came up with some conclusions that, in fact, engineering um, has a cycle to it. It starts with, um, must be a better way of doing this. And that leads you to an idea, which then leads you to build a prototype, which then leads you to test it, and almost never works, and that leads you to, well, there must be a better idea, and you keep doing this. That's how the aircraft industry was developed in a bicycle shop in Ohio, um, not in a physics lab, okay? Uh, it, there wasn't a theorem about aeronautics that led them to implement it. They experimented with it until they got it to work. The theorems came later to explain why it works. Um, that's really fundamental here. So we concluded, actually, that engineering is a process, it's not a body of knowledge. Now, it involves a body of knowledge, but you can have a transcript that has grades in thermodynamics and mechanics and electrical circuits and so forth, and it doesn't make you an engineer. Um, learning how to take an idea, implement it, and change lives is what an engineer is about. And we teach very little of the process. I mean, I had like one course in my undergraduate uh, career that had that as its goal. Um, and it, by the way, it didn't work when I got to the end. Which, and they gave me a, a degree anyway, uh, <laughs> which I always wondered about. Uh, so how serious can they be? You know, it's like giving you one math test and you failed it. So that's okay. Just go on out the door. <laughs> uh, so that's, it's not just about that. Uh, there are a lot of other folks who've been worrying about this as well. Um, one of them is... Um, Professor Warren Searing at MIT, and they did a, a deep dive study of alumni and what alumni tell them about their education at MIT versus their career. And, they, and the students basically concluded they didn't use hardly any of what they learned at MIT. Most of what they needed was not taught at MIT, and they had to learn later. Uh, this, is, this is eloquently provided in another YouTube uh, presentation, in about 40-minute presentation by Woody Flowers. Has anybody heard of Woody Flowers? Yeah, Woody's a great friend of ours. He's, in fact, an adjunct faculty for the first decade or so at Olin. Um, in addition to what you know, probably more important now is learning how to learn independently because most of the stuff you're going to need is not going to be there um, when you're in school, and deciding what to learn. What book do you put in your briefcase? Um, that's where we need guidance. Um, this is also... Um, developed by the NAE report, The Engineer of 2020, in a, a very interesting book, um, Holistic Engineering Education by Domenico Grasso and his crew. Um, so this is not just Olin. We're just uh, catching up. Finally, how we teach. What do, what do we do about the pedagogical approach to teaching? By the way, what is the best way to teach today? And you know, there's a whole lot written on this. I'm sure there are people in the education school that could give you courses on it for a long time. Let me just summarize this by the recent book by John Seeley Brown. If folks know John Seeley Brown, I mean, he's a good resident here in the Bay Area, former uh, chief technology officer. Oh, good, good. They're very good. So I'm, I'm going over old ground here. Um, basically, the idea is the traditional way of thinking about education is knowledge transfer from my head to yours. You need to know what those formulas are in spherical coordinates, and so I'm giving them to you. Um, the new way of thinking about it is we're teaching you to construct this knowledge in your head. So what only, the only thing that counts is your ability to build the knowledge from scratch. In addition to that, this, this approach basically breeds a can't-do attitude. No matter how hard you try, there's, there's another more advanced course in math after this one. And no matter how much you ask the teacher, can I build the airplane now, 
oh, no, no, you can't pick up a wrench until you're a senior and after you've had these other courses. It's a can't-do thing. Um, and in fact, the newer model is empowering, can-do. The old model is follow orders. Put your pencil down. It's 8 o'clock. Okay, game time test is over with. Don't talk to your neighbors. Uh, the new model is follow your passions. What do you really care about? There, is, there are no boundaries. Um, learn in class versus learn 24-7. Um, learning alone, now learning in teams. The old model I'm going to claim is problem-based learning, where somebody gives you the problem and you go away and solve it. The new model is design-based learning, where nobody gives you the problem. You have to be creative in, in creating, diagnosing and creating the context for the problem, exercising those creative skills right from the beginning. By the way, that's not new. This is, in fact, the pedagogy that we use in the PhD program all the time. It's also not only the pedagogy in the PhD program. Have you ever heard of the Montessori schools? Okay. We've also used this in K-12. What's happened is in the middle, we somehow industrialized education and lost it. Um, and that needs to be restored. My favorite quote from the book, for most of the 20th century, our educational systems have been built on the assumption that teaching is necessary for learning to occur. Actually, is isn't. Um, okay. Can creativity be taught? Okay. Can entrepreneurship be taught? Can music be taught? Can any creative activity be taught? Well, I can tell you, you get better at playing the piano if you practice. Okay? You get more creative if you practice as well. Uh, these are two of my favorite books in this field. Um, Tony Wagner is a good friend of ours at Harvard. He has a 23-page uh, section in this book on the Olden Learning Model, where he explains how it helps to prepare innovators. And uh, this is Tom Kelly at Stanford, whom I'm sure you know, talking about developing creative confidence. The key to all of this is the same, learning to improvise. It's being creative is about learning to improvise. And I learned this by being the, uh, the uh, chair of the accreditation committee that visited Berkeley College of Music last year. So and a couple years ago, I was the chair of the accreditation committee for the New England Conservatory of Music, which is completely different. You know, one is classical, it's playing the notes that Beethoven wrote 200 years ago and doing it perfectly. And the other one is a musical conversation where you have to invent it on live, on stage, in contact with somebody else. Uh, complete, in fact, it uses a different part of your brain, and that's now very easy to see in fMRI studies. So we have to teach engineering so that it uses that other part of the brain, which shows up when a jazz musician is on stage. And that will do more for creating innovators than anything else. Finally, motivations play a key role in this. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of James Heckman at the University of Chicago, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist who's been looking at um, why it is that students don't succeed. Uh, this is a fascinating book. I highly recommend it. And the, the bottom line here is that he concludes that grit is a three times better predictor of career success than knowledge or intelligence, okay? So what is grit? Well, grit has to do with determination, an unwillingness to stop no matter what, a belief that you can do it, and a commitment to do whatever it takes to succeed. And uh, in fact, Angela Duckworth, who's a, a MacArthur Fellow last year at the University of Penn, is now doing deep dive studies and to figure out how do you teach grit? Because if you can get that across, the other stuff pretty much takes care of itself. We have concluded that intrinsic motivation is a key source of grit. If students already care about this and they're passionate about it, they become obsessed, they spend all their time doing it, they will learn and you can't stop them from learning. So using intrinsic motivation as a part of your pedagogical uh, arsenal is going to be highly effective at producing success. Um, by the way, another YouTube. Did you, does everybody know about this book? Um, Dan Peake's book on Drive? If you, if, you, if you haven't, there's a 10 minute video that will give you all of the key highlights. It's a great book. Finally, I'm almost done. Chuck Vest, many of you know, recently passed away, one of our greatest um, academic leaders, I believe. His words, making universities and engineering schools exciting, creative, adventurous, rigorous, demanding, and empowering milieus is more important 
than specifying curricular details. And we couldn't agree with him more. Um, finally, outcomes. So Olin is doing all this stuff. Does it work? You know, if you're doing this, aren't you not doing something else? So, you know, you come out with artists or something, but they're not engineers. Um, so what happens? And you know, so here's some summaries of what's happening to the Olin uh, students so far. The, here's the confirmation of our culture. Uh, Princeton Review, you may know about that. It's a college guide. It looks at students in all universities. Last year, Olin was ranked number two in America among all universities for students study the most. It's not a place you go to put your heels up on weekends and go party. These kids are intensely committed. Um, it's also number eight in the happiest students in America. Now do that at the same time, and you've got this learning culture. Okay? It's not drudgery. Um, it's something they enjoy. Um, companies have discovered it too, so the kids are now in great demand. Um, a significant fraction of that is because they're being bought by a few uh, computer software companies who are paying. Uh, they, they, one company has recruited 20% of our graduating class for each of the last three years. They would recruit all of them if they could get them to do it. Um, now, I thought I would end by just showing you what happens to outcomes. This is the most authentic way of talking about outcomes that I could think of. That's our entire class of 2006, every student. They're, you know, they're there in their T-shirts um, when they're freshmen showing up. Um, so these are the ones who became PhDs or MDs or JDs by now. And I can show you sort of what they did. That's the first kid, Michael Curtis, who in three and a half years got his PhD in atomic and laser physics at Oxford. Um, the next one, Kayon Nguyen, went here, UC Berkeley, is an NSF fellow, material science. Um, Polina went to Stanford, NSF fellow, uh, Kate Blazek, another NSF fellow at Stanford. Uh, Tasha Caves, another NSF fellow at Stanford. Janet Tsai, NSF fellow at Colorado. Jay Gantz is a Fulbright who went uh, MD, PhD at Washington. Uh, Tommy Cecil got his law degree. He's a patent attorney in um, Dallas. Uh, Chris Murphy got his PhD at MIT in robotics. Um, Caitlin Foley is getting her MD, PhD in progress at Tufts University. It takes a long time to do that, by the way. Um, Drew Harry's got his PhD at MIT. Um, Suti D's doing genetics at the University of Chicago. Jersey's doing statistics at Carnegie Mellon. Juliana um, did her PhD in math at Columbia. She's a professor of math at Sacred Heart University. Sean Munson's PhD in information at Michigan, assistant professor of engineering, University of Washington at Seattle. Uh, Kathy King, a PhD in operations research at Cornell. By the way, the class is so small, my wife and I invite every student to our house in small groups for dinner every year. So we sort of think of them as our own kids. It, it helps with the um, empty nest syndrome uh, a little bit. Um, Amanda Blackwood uh, is doing her PhD in WPI. These are the ones who, who decided to go the, the business route. Okay? And uh, so Aaron McCusker got her MBA at Duke, she's a consultant. Francis Hogan is a manager here at Google, the Harvard MBA. Dan Lindquist got his MBA at Northwestern, is doing Deloitte. That's an interesting thing. A lot of engineering schools have kids that go to business, and they are financial consultants. 2% of Olin's alumni have gone into financial consulting. They want to make stuff, um, something about the program. Kim, uh, MBA at Harvard. Nicole, a nuclear engineer. M Michael Taylor. Um, Matt Hill, MS at Stanford. He's at Apple. Kristen Stafford. Adam Horton's at Tesla, Susan Fredholm, NSF fellow, MIT, Will Clayton, MBA at Harvard. These are the ones who did odd stuff, things that you wouldn't expect, okay? Like Nick Zola, who got his PhD in religion, and he's a professor of Old Testament or something like that at uh, this Christian school. Uh, Kate Walsh started a new company in, at Stanford. Leighton Ige started a new company in the sophomore year in college. He's still running it. Um, Emma Goodman is an actress. So she's an on-stage performer in, in New York and in Boston. Uh, Kevin Tostado is a film producer. He had his, um, his capstone project in his senior year, won the Ind Independent Film Festival Award in 2007, the next year after he graduated. Sarah Oliver is a farmer, and she's a cheesemaker. Okay. 
um, Jeff Satwood started a, a company called Big Belly Solar, which makes solar-powered trash compactors. They're now all over the world. Um, last piece. So what's ahead for Olin? And this has to do with Berkeley. Uh, we call it Decade Two. The first decade was spent learning how kids learn and building a new program from the ground up. Decade Two is about meeting our mission, which is to become a laboratory for this for everyone else. So we've been visited by more than 300 universities in four years. We have actually a whole staff team that does nothing but host visits. Um, Berkeley folks would be welcome to visit. Okay? It would not be a burden. It would be an honor. Um, next. Some of our many collaborators include these institutions. Maybe you've heard of the University of Illinois out there on the plains. Um, these guys have chartered an airplane. And on March 11th, they're being, bringing 10 people, including the dean of engineering and a number of department chairs, to visit us again. We have started a partnership with them about five years ago. And as a result of work together, they have re-engineered their undergraduate engineering program so that all 1,500 incoming freshmen take a co-designed program in engineering. And they're now so enthusiastic about it, they want to spread it into the junior and senior year. And Dean Adesita, who was our partner, became provost. And now he wants to talk about doing this across the whole university, sort of the maker university concept. Um, so they're big supporters. INSPIR is a school in Brazil that's building an entirely new university on this model. So as we speak, there are, the construction is underway for a new engineering school. University of Texas at El Paso is a very important partner for us because we're learning about a completely different student population. We're worried about whether the pedagogies that we use will not be effective in different student populations. And the only way to do this is to experiment. And we've done some work with Stanford. Harvard's re-engineering their program. Um, so what's this about? Through consultation and co-design and collaboration with other universities, we intend to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. And that's what I had to say. So thank you very much. Questions? A few questions, huh? Uh, please identify yourselves also. Uh, hi, Chris Kinney. I'm a high school teacher and also got my PhD here at Berkeley. Um, I like a lot of what you had to say, and my question would be, what recommendations do you have to implement what you've talked about to the, uh, for lack of a better word, the naysayers, the people who, um, yeah, I guess leave it at that. <laughs> Well, um, I think it's important that the country has a variety of approaches to engineering. Uh, it's, it's just fine if we have some traditional schools that don't change. I don't think there's a problem with that. But what we need to do is stop copying each other and being exactly the same in every institution. Um, if you actually want to make change within an institution, it's more complicated than starting with a blank sheet of paper. What only did. And you actually have five rules that are very important for making change within the university, which I can tell you about. Okay. Yeah. Here? No? No? My, my bad. Sorry. Here. Hi. Uh, so, Olin is a very small private college, and Cal is a very large public university. How do we implement some of the changes here at Cal? Improvise, right? Um, it takes willing people. I think the, the model that happened at Illinois is a good example because Illinois is at least as large, I think, as Berkeley in terms of enrollment. Um, and what happened there was the chancellor of, uh, actually the provost at Illinois was a good friend who had seen some of the things that were going on here at Olin and wanted them to show up at Illinois. So she dropped some breadcrumbs down a path for like-minded faculty members to pick up. Several of them did, including a guy that we think is a singularity. His name is David uh, Goldberg. I don't know if you know Dave Goldberg, but um, he was the leader of the Illinois team that did the experiments in the first couple of years that proved that it could be done at Illinois with really less resources than you think. 
and they have something called the iFoundry there. If you go to the Illinois website, you can see this really well uh, demonstrated. And over the period of the first summer, I think there were uh, 100 volunteer students that wanted to do experiments. There were a handful of faculty members. They came out to visit Olin a few times. They benchmarked some things, modified it for their environment, and launched it. And while it almost crashed and burned the first time because this, the students revolted. Um, this is not the way students are used, used to learning either. Um, when you come in and you tell them you have to build this, and then you go sit in the corner and fold your arms, um, they complain to the dean, I paid tuition. These people are supposed to be teaching me. Uh, they're apparently, um, you know, vacationing or something. What's going on? And eventually one of the kids figures it out, and then it takes off like wildfire. Um, there's a longer story to this, but we have some literature on it, which I could send you if you want. Uh, Hi, so my name is Josh. Uh, Josh, good. Okay. And I'm, oh, and I'm a, a fourth-year undergrad, and so... Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what you said really resonated with me at like a deep level. Okay. I just came through four years of working with the system and sometimes in spite of the system to teach, to learn, right? And a, lot, a lot of what I've, I've been going through, like it, just, it really hit me hard, like Berkeley's successes and also its flaws. And so my question for you as someone coming out of this system, how do I help change that? Or how do, how do I move to a new path? Yeah, well, uh, this is a question that happens uh, actually quite a lot. Our own students uh, often tell us that they really want to make change in education when they graduate. We thought we were teaching engineering. They thought we were teaching education reform. And I, I can't imagine how they would get that idea. But um, So what to do with them? And it's not an easy um, answer. I mean, if you have a bachelor's degree in engineering, what can you do about education reform? A number of them get involved right away in K-12. And we've had a number of students who went immediately, they're high school teachers in the different, different areas, and they are making an impact. From, in fact, I personally worry more about um, high school than I do about the first two years in undergraduate colleges. Um, they're both leaky pipelines, but I think we, we could do a lot for this country if we could reinvent them. Um, the students who are more patient, uh, we can encourage to continue and to get a PhD in engineering education and spend their career working to change universities from the inside. Um, we have a number of them that are off doing that now uh, from Olin. Okay? Yeah, uh, you know, I have to say this has been just a wonderful and stimulating talk and uh, you know, I was uh, quite struck when you put up uh, John C. Lee Brown's book and uh, I remember feeling the same sort of charge and call to action that I felt from your talk. So for me personally, and if I can address Josh, you know, we are with uh, uh, Professor Miller, President Miller, in terms of what we need to do at Berkeley, you know, and if I can just sort of add to this uh, dialogue on this campus, you know, what President Miller has argued for is really a much more engaged uh, customized education, sort of the anti-MOOC of education. And I hope that we all remember this because there is a campus debate about whether you teach to millions or you provide a really good experiential education where you learn to learn. And I, I am on the side of President Miller. And the challenge, I think, uh, you asked about what the challenges are for Berkeley, is we, we're going to have to figure out how to provide a customized education without breaking the bank. You know? And he has shown that it is possible. And his very first slide, President Miller's very first slide, is he keeps the tuition low. And you know, his student faculty ratio is only 9 to 1, and maybe it will become less than 9 to 1. Our challenge is going to be to bring more people to the classrooms to be the... So the coach on the sidelines rather than the sage on the stage, which is, the, which is what you said throughout. So thank you very much. You know, this is really a wonderful uh, national debate. I'm really glad you've kicked us off. Mm -hmm. We will, uh, I know the uh, Jim Plummer had uh, all his department chairs fly out, but maybe we'll fly out in a bigger contingent here <laughs> to come and see you. <laughs> maybe after the thaw, though. <laughs>
<laughs> Just wait, wait till May. <laughs> I, this concludes our view from the top, and please join me in thanking <laughs> Cousin Miller. Fantastic talk. Oh, I, I think, by the way, we were talking about YouTube, so this talk will be on our YouTube channel before the end of the week. And in the interim, we'll a small token of appreciation, a Berkeley engineer. <laughs> I'd like to thank our student group co-sponsor, ASME, and I look forward to seeing you March 18th at the cool lecture featuring Sehat Sutarja. Goodbye, and go Bears. Fabulous talk. Just a fabulous